All right. Well, Greg, if you'd lead us in a prayer, and uh, we will get rolling today. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessings we have day by day. And we ask, Lord, that you would open our hearts as we look into your word and help us, Lord, to learn more about your son, to see him as he is. Help us, Lord, to strive to follow him in all things. For it is in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Well, today we're doing, as you can see, uh, King of the Jews. And a lot of the, the king ideas we looked at when we looked at Son of David. And so kind of keep in the back of your mind that, that all the times of, of the, the, the comparison between um, King Jesus and King David and a lot of, and even some of the other kings of the Old Testament, of course, Jesus became the ultimate example uh, of them, uh, of kingship and of having a kingdom. And so, so I kind of went, a, not a different route, but just didn't touch again on a lot of the passages that we looked at that week and you can of course go back and, and pump up our watch numbers <laughs> i'm just joking but greg and i were just talking about that how people people are people are watching we the total from two weeks ago would be similar to what we'd have in room 200 on a tuesday morning so that's great and so uh, we're very uh, happy about that of course um so today we're going to look at king of the jews and and we didn't have any other week on on his kingship. So I'm going to look at a few different phrases, not just king of the Jews uh, today, and uh, starting off with uh, just the idea of king. And in Zechariah 9, 9 and 10, we read, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. And so let's just stay here for a, a few moments here in Zechariah 9, 9 and 10, and just notice how this king who is coming will be. It's interesting that not just the Jews, but other ancient Near Eastern civilizations, they had some similar uh, prophecies, of course, not real prophecies as, you know, not from God, of course, but their own feelings of what the future would hold. And almost with all of them, the future would have in it some kind of king that would provide the ultimate salvation, the ultimate deliverance. And of course, this in the Hebrew context is Christ. And actually for all of them, even if they didn't know it, was Christ. So he is the ultimate king, but he's different. He is righteous. Um, look about uh, four lines down in verse nine. And righteous to the to the ultimate, perfectly righteous. Of course, we know without sin while he was here on this earth. Um, and having salvation is he. But at the same time, this king, this king of the Jews, the same time this king was bringing deliverance, he was humble, comes in on a donkey, um, as we read on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And our king, King Jesus, he also, notice down at the end of verse 10, he shall speak peace to the nations. So he's not going to come in like some of the other kings and destroy other nations or put other nations underneath him, although there is a sense in which he does that, of course, but not in the worldly way that these people would have been thinking. He's going to speak peace. And we've mentioned more than once that peace in the Old Testament setting, this idea of shalom, is more than just peace. It's wholeness, completeness, a fulfillment. And of course, Jesus is going to fill the nations and make them whole. His rule shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. 
um, normally the river is the Euphrates River, and um, here it would be. So he's going to rule everywhere. And, um, and so quite a king who is coming uh, that Zechariah is prophesying. And of course, we see the fulfillment of verse 9 when Jesus comes in on uh, uh, what some call Palm Sunday today, uh, when Jesus comes in, uh, his triumphal entry into uh, Jerusalem. So a couple other, before we get to King of the Jews specifically, a couple other phrases used um, with the idea of king, and one is king of glory. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts, he is the king of glory. And um, there's a guy who has written or compiled a series of books, uh, such as all the names and titles of, of God in the Bible, all the miracles in the Bible, all the, just, there are like at least a dozen of them, maybe 15 or 20 of these books. And he had a, a neat uh, statement here. He said that the king of glory was the Lord of glory, cruel men crucified, but who at his ascension found the everlasting doors open to receive him is clearly evident from the language of this glory psalm. Kings of ancient time, when they returned from battles, conspicuous victories, entered their capital in triumph and gave gifts to the people. It was so with the one who came from glory and was born a king. And I, I love these different passages that imply or explicitly state that Jesus was king. We'll look at, of course, some of those in Matthew um, shortly. And then I really liked um, how Lockyer uh, created uh, the, the parallels here and kind of organized the thoughts here. He was the king appointed of God. Uh, a couple references. I won't read all the references. He was completely victorious over the enemies of God and over Satan, and over the grave, sin, and death. Uh, if you'll recall Sunday morning, Greg was talking about the last enemy to be destroyed is death. Um, earlier in 1 Corinthians 15, but um, in that same chapter as well. And, and that's what a king does. A king, a righteous king, a king from God is victorious. He was humiliated, but afterwards exalted. He endured the cross, but is now crowned with many diadems. He entered his heavenly capital in triumph and gave gifts unto men. Uh, Psalms uh, 68, 18, Acts 2, and Ephesians 4, uh, verse 8. He will be manifested in all his glory when he returns as king. And so I really liked all those references and all those statements about our king uh, being put together here uh, by Locke here. And then uh, just to, to wrap up that, uh, here's the passage he was referencing uh, that mentions Lord of glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. Uh, Greg, I always like it when you mention uh, with the word glory, the idea of the, the glory of the Lord leading uh, the Israelites uh, out of Egypt and through the wilderness, the, the translucent or glowing cloud, which appeared as fire in the night, and as that cloud in the day. Um, and the Lord's glory sitting over uh, the mercy seat. Um, quite amazing uh, pictures for us and quite amazing thoughts for us. And we are to give glory to the Lord. And of course, we can't give the Lord's glory to himself. When we give glory to the Lord, but we are praising him. We are uh, thanking him. We are honoring him in the way that's appropriate. We are responding to him and his glory and his name. 
uh, when we talk about calling upon the name of the Lord, it's he himself. And same with this glory. It's the very essence of who God is. And I think that's really um, extremely uh, moving for us and extremely uh, humbling for us, but at the same time gives us confidence, this assurance and confidence we've been talking about this summer um, and fall. King over all the earth is another uh, way that uh, Christ is described um, in, in the prophecies and in the Bible. Uh, Zechariah 14, uh, 6 through 9. On that day, there shall be no light, cold, or frost, and there shall be a unique day, which is known to the Lord, neither day or night, but at evening time there shall be light. On that day, living waters shall flow out from Jerusalem, half of them to the eastern sea and half of them to the western sea. It shall continue in summer as in winter, and the Lord will be king over all the earth. On that day, the Lord will be one and his name one. And so just a few um, uh, supporting verses here as well. Isaiah 54, 5, for your maker is your husband, the Lord of hosts is his name, and the Holy One of Israel is your redeemer, the God of the whole earth, he is called. And then in Psalm 19, 1, uh, 1 through 4, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words, whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. And something I was thinking about here with this idea of king over all the earth was the fact that the, the people in Bible times, they, they had a way of thinking that was more collective uh, than we do. We we definitely think more categorically. We like to break things out into different pieces and study the pieces, and, and there is nothing wrong with that. But we also think about that. We kind of think differently about the church and about God's people and just more individualistic as opposed to collectively and thinking about the, um, uh, the, the universal church, the the, uh, the, the ones who have gone on before us, I just think they did a better job. And also with creation and God's glory and the glory of Christ. And, and I think they just thought about these things more holistically uh, than we do. And, and right here, this was a moment uh, looking at Psalm 19 again, where this kind of came through to me and, and different things may come through uh, to you all. But for me, it was, you know, they really did um, and of course, by inspiration, and but they really did think of things in a in a broader way, which I think is really healthy. And so, something I'm going to try to do just in my personal um, uh, spiritual development is to um, continue to look at things, you know, piece by piece, but realizing that that all these things go together. And I think, uh, Greg, I'll, I'll compliment you again, but I think Greg does a great job of of providing those things. And, and as we've gone through this study, we see week after week, different, different titles and names that we've looked at. Of course, some of them, and we're going to see this later in this lesson as well, sometimes we'll see three or four in, in one little paragraph of scripture. And it's, it's just so neat and so encouraging to me. Um, and, and I, again, I'm going to strive to think as broadly as I can concerning God, uh, the Father, Son, and Spirit, concerning uh, the Word of God and His creation, as we read about here in Psalm 19, and, and then concerning the church, and really striving to be, um, to be thinking more about the community and the individuals, and not just so much the individuals, which anyway, the community is made up of the individuals, I know but thinking more collectively, which I think the Old Testament and New Testament church lived out uh, possibly a little bit better than we did. So kind of a side note there, but uh, that's, that's really what I was thinking about this time with, uh, with Psalm 19. So um, any comments at this point? I'll just, I, we haven't, I haven't been doing that as much on these Tuesday morning classes, but uh, yeah, go ahead, uh, mom or dad. 
of course I thought of a song and I, you know, oh, like in these scriptures, there are lots yeah. of songs that could be chosen, but um, I just wanted to read a little bit of crown him with many crowns, <laughs> crown him with many crowns, the lamb upon the throne, hark how the heavenly anthem drowns all music, but its own awake my soul and sing of him who died for thee and hail him as thy matchless king through all eternity. I just thought that was appropriate. <laughs> Mom and son thinking alike. I, I, I looked at that one last night and said, so I was so glad you read it because I have two others that I'm going to quote from, but, but not that one. So that was perfect. So because that was the other one that really, really fits and is really, really neat. But anyway, thank you so much. So, um, so now we move to King of the Jews. So that was just all a little bit of preliminary stuff. And now this idea of Jesus being King of the Jews. And by the way, I'll, I'll close out with King of Kings and Lord of Lords um, and look at uh, uh, some of the encouraging things about him coming again as we close today. But uh, so right now, King of the Jews, I think most of us, or I shouldn't say most of us, but I definitely think about what Pilate wrote and what was above Jesus on the cross. And so John 19, uh, 19 through 22, Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Aramaic and Latin and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, do not write the King of the Jews, but rather this man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. And uh, I think of the Ten Commandments and Charlton Heston and the and Yule Brenner, I guess, played uh, Pharaoh. Um, so let it be written, so let it be done. <laughs> Pilate has a moment of, just a moment of nobility here. And I think, of course, uh, led divinely through providence and God's sovereignty that, uh, that a truth should be put uh, above Jesus on the cross. And I think, um, I think it's great that this title uh, was there. And ultimately, um, that was the charge. Ultimately, as we've been going through on uh, Sunday nights in Steve Payne's class, um, uh, this was ultimately the only thing they could get to stick. And uh, anyway, Pilate was, a, we wouldn't say noble through this whole process, but here, uh, he stood his ground, and that's that's kind of uh, kind of neat. So we see the kingship of Christ uh, all through, and earlier in John's gospel, and we'll get to uh, some of the other gospels in a little bit. But um, John one forty three to fifty one, the next day Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, "Follow me." Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip said to him, come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, how do you know me? Jesus answered him before Philip called you when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus answered him, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree. Do you believe you will see greater things than these? And he said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the son of man. So here we see several of these uh, titles, several of these things we've talked about. We have, and it's interesting to me, Nathaniel connecting, and the people, they really did seem to do a good job. I think sometimes we think, yeah, they really didn't have a good concept of the Messiah, and they did think there was going to be an earthly kingdom. So that, that whole side of what they were thinking, or at least the impression we have of what they were thinking, you know, was wrong. You know, they were thinking earthly king, earthly kingdom. They were thinking all these things would happen physically. We'll get rid of Rome, you know. So that whole side of it was off. But here, Nathaniel equates the Son of God with the King of Israel. I mean, he he puts this all together as 
I'm thinking he's thinking, the Messiah, the one who is to come, the anointed one. And, and when with King, we would assume that he's thinking that. And he puts these things together. And then Jesus, of course, uh, uses son of man here, um, talks about himself in the third person, which he, he was uh, apt to do uh, when talking about these uh, future things. So really, really neat passage right here in the very, very first chapter of, um, of John. Um, not only was the birth uh, one of the Christ, the anointed one, the Lord, Christ the Lord here, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord, this being spoken uh, to, the, to the shepherds, um, or yes. And then, but here in Matthew, um, we, um, we have King of the Jews. So not only the, the Christ, the anointed one, um, but here a king. So Matthew 2, 1 through 6. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we, we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. So these magi out of the east um, they um, they call him the king of the Jews. And of course, this upset Herod, and he tries to figure out when they saw the star. And of course, he kills all the babies, this being a couple years later, uh, kills all the young boys um, shortly after this. Uh, when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. Um, and so, of course, the the, uh, the, the kings out of the east uh, trick him and go back a different way. They do not go back and report to him as he had uh, desired. And then finishing up this uh, passage here, they told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Uh, so right there we have the idea of ruler, and this idea of shepherd, um, it's not necessarily a separation of ideas. Uh, kings were all, were, I was about to say, oftentimes I will say uh, at least regularly uh, described as uh, shepherds. First Timothy 1, uh, 12 to 17. We have uh, several of our uh, titles and names put together here. I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord. Because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service, though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent. But I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But I received mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. To the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. We're going to see in just a little bit that um, a king has to have a kingdom, <laughs> of course, and has to have a realm. And Jesus does uh, have that. And he talks about that with Pilate. So let's look at uh, Pilate, um, the, the interchange with Pilate a little bit more here. Uh, so Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, are you the king of the Jews? And again, Pilate ends up putting this above the cross, which I think is, is fabulous. Jesus answered, do you say this of your own accord or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. Then Pilate said to him, so you are a king. And Jesus answered, you say that I'm a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, or famously, 
um, what is true. After he'd said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him. Um, Pilate was just um, obviously in a terrible position. He made a terrible choice. He didn't have, uh, didn't have the guts, so to speak, uh, to do the right thing. But, uh, but all part of God's plan. And, uh, and of course, for our salvation. Jesus points out here that his kingdom is from another place. So it's from another place, uh, from uh, the heavens, from God Almighty. And it is not only from another place, but it, it is a whole different realm. It's a spiritual kingdom as opposed to a physical kingdom. And we see this in so many different ways um, as the church is described to us in scripture. Um, us being uh, the new Israel. Uh, we are the new people. We are the kingdom. We are um, the ones that Jesus is reigning over. And just not a side point, but a response to that is we need to allow him to reign. He needs to be able to uh, reign in us. And that's another song. I didn't think to put it in here, but that would be another one uh, for us to um, uh, think about allowing God, praying to God to allow Jesus to reign uh, in our lives. Colossians 1, 13 and 14, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. So here again, we see that Jesus has a kingdom and the only people who have kingdoms are kings and we are part of that kingdom. First lesson, First Thessalonians 2, 11 and 12, similar idea. For you know how, like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God, who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. And of course, Christ is the one who reigns in that kingdom. God is king as well. God as a whole, Father, Son, and Spirit. And uh, of course, uh, but Jesus is the deliverer. Jesus is, is the king. Um, Matthew Matthew is the book that has the most uh, kingdom language, so to speak. Um, Jesus comes through, I, I wouldn't say stronger than the other places, but Matthew just uses the words more. And it comes through um, uh, ringing very clearly when you read the book of, of Matthew. Uh, in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So this was John the Baptist's message, uh, the kingdom is here. And then Jesus, once John gets put in prison in the very next chapter, from that time, Jesus began to preach saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So John the Baptist, the forerunner, is making these claims. Of course, in, Matthew, in Matthew's account, it's verse 16 of chapter 3, where Jesus is baptized uh, by John. And as soon as John is kind of out of commission, Jesus proclaims the same uh, the same thing. And the kingdom's at hand because the king is here. And uh, we see that very nicely in the triumphal procession that will take place at the end of Jesus' ministry. So in Matthew, uh, the kingdom is mentioned 53 times, and 31 of those, it's in conjunction with heaven. So kingdom of heaven, that exact phrase, 31 times, um, and then kingdom, another uh, 22 times. Uh, besides those 31. So really strong in the book of Matthew. The, the strongest chapter is chapter uh, 13. I'm not going to uh, read uh, all these verses in 11 through 52, um, but we see I, Isaiah being prophesied, or, or the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy. You will indeed hear, but never understand, and you will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart, and turn, and I would heal them. And this is Jesus responding to why he speaks in parables, why he's doing things uh, the certain way that he is doing it. Um, he says to his disciples, but blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For truly I say to you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see, and did not see it, and to hear what you hear, and did not hear it. So let me flip on down um, to near near the end of the chapter, and you see all these parables that he's giving them. Um, 
And here, starting in 31, he put another parable before them saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed. Verse 33, the kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour. Um, he talked in parables and he explains that. And then uh, a few more times, and I think it's like 13 or 14 times in this section, uh, the kingdom of heaven, verse 44, is like treasure hidden in a field. 45, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. Um, verse 47, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. Have you understood all these things? <laughs> they said to him, yes. And he said to them, therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. And not just chapter 13, but I think it's chapter 15 or 16, another load of times the kingdom is talked about. And again, with all these, Jesus is the king and he has a kingdom. And this kingdom is one that invites and brings people in and expands and grows. And that's the reign of Christ. And we have been given responsibility. So our, our take home is our responsibility for these things. Um, so now let's uh, shift over to um, the, or one more here before we shift over. Um, they will make war on the lamb and the lamb will conquer them for he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And those with him are called and chosen and faithful. So just to kind of wrap up that idea of the kingdom and Jesus being King of the Jews, um, things are going to happen against Jesus. Things are going to happen here worded against the lamb, but the lamb will prevail. Jesus is victorious over all of God's enemies, including death, et cetera, et cetera. And he will prevail. Um, those with him are called and chosen and faithful. And the, we are, we are, we are the people in the realm. We are the people in, we, we are the kingdom. Um, Lead me to Calvary. I think I just put verses one and four in here. Uh, King of my life, I crown thee now. Thine shall the glory be. Lest I forget thy thorn-crowned brow. Lead me to Calvary. May I be willing, Lord, to bear daily my cross for thee. Even thy cup of grief to share. Thou hast borne all for me. Lest I forget Gethsemane. Lest I forget thine agony. Lest I forget thy love for me lead me to Calvary. So our king, like in the very first passage we looked at, Zechariah 9, 9 and 10, our king actually died, but then of course was resurrected. Um, so different than the perception of the people around, not just the Jews, but the people around that area at the time for the deliverer who comes, the king who comes, um, you know, death wouldn't have been part of their picture of how that would take place. But of course, God's ways are above our ways and his thoughts are above our thoughts. So let's check out the idea of King and Kings, a King of Kings real quickly uh, before we uh, close out. This is uh, just a, an amazing concept and we'll, we'll spend a few minutes here. Um, so Jesus is our King. He's King of the Jews. He's King of the whole earth. He's the King of glory. Um, and he is the king of kings. Then I saw heaven open and behold a white horse. The one sitting on it is called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood and the name by which he is called is the word of God. And the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress on the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And so we look at this and we contrast it, so to speak, with the cross. And Jesus is all these things at once. Again, collectively, the whole look at Jesus Christ. He is the Lion of Judah. And he is the Lamb of God. And uh, this is what makes him the ultimate king. He is the king of kings and lord of lords. This, this title, king of kings, uh, was not unheard of um, concerning other kings. 
Um, just want to uh, point that out. It was a title used by other cultures around the area in Ezra. We read, this is a copy of the letter that King Artaxerxes gave to Ezra the priest, the scribe, a man learned in matters of the commandments of the Lord and his statutes for Israel. Artaxerxes, king of kings, to Ezra the priest and the scribe of the law of the God of heaven. Peace. And now I make a decree that any one of the people of Israel or their priests or Levites in my kingdom who freely offers to go to Jerusalem may go with you. So um, anyway, King of Kings, um, uh, Ben-Hadad, um, and there were several of them, <laughs> uh, son of Hadad, Hadad was their God, uh, but uh, Ben-Hadad had 32 kings under him. So he was a King of Kings, so to speak. Jesus, of course, is the ultimate King of Kings. He will be the, the ultimate ruler, not just over 32 kings or not just Artaxerxes who was over however many he was over. Um, Jesus is all of these ideas of kingship taken to the ultimate. Uh, Greg has mentioned before that, you know, God is described as a father, um, but we, we can't point to any father here on earth who obviously is exactly like that. He is that picture to the ultimate completeness, fulfillment, uh, fullness and perfection. And same with this idea of King of Kings. Um, Revelation 11, 15 to 18. Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sit on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God saying, we give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, who is and who was, for you have taken your great power and begun to reign. The nations raged, but your wrath came, and the time for the dead to be judged, and for rewarding your servants, the prophets and saints, and those who fear your name, both small and great, and for destroying the destroyers of the earth. You've begun to reign. These things will take place, and we, of course, have the privilege and the blessing of knowing about them uh, ahead of time. And then Revelation 12, 10 through 12, I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down who accuses them day and night before our God. And they have conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they loved not their lives even unto death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath, because he knows that his time is short. And so we see in Jesus the king, the things that you would expect of a king, one who reigns, one who conquers. And in this case, he's the one who defeats and conquers all of God's enemies, but even death in the end. And that's uh, amazing for us. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Uh, we will all bow. We will all confess uh, to our King, uh, Jesus Christ. Um, one more song. We will glorify the King of Kings. We will glorify the Lamb. We will glorify the Lord of Lords, who is the great I am. Lord Jehovah reigns in majesty. We will bow before his throne. We will worship him in righteousness. We will worship him alone. By the way, when I first heard this, this is, uh, <laughs> I just thought, why do we have to worship him alone? Why can't we be with other people? <laughs> I just totally took that the wrong way when I first heard this song. But of course, we're not going to worship anyone else but him. Uh, he is Lord of heaven, Lord of earth. He is Lord of all who live. He is Lord above the universe. All praise to him we give. Hallelujah to the King of kings. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Hallelujah to the Lord of lords who is the great I am. So Greg, I'll let you add something if you would like, and then we'll take any other questions or comments. But go ahead, Greg. Well, it is uh, interesting you were mentioning King of Kings. Uh, the Shah of Iran, his actual title was Shah of Shahs. Oh, wow. Interesting. Even as, even as recently as the 1970s, 
we had uh, a Mideastern um, monarch who used that title. And it is not necessarily a, an idea of having underlings, although certainly they could. Mm -hmm. It's the superlative. It is just simply uh, of all that you could think of a king being. Mm -hmm. This is the king par excellence. Um, we begin looking at this. I believe we do lack something in our country because um, we, of course, have um, from our inception been a republic. And that is the, the rare exception when you look at world history. Um, until very recently, most countries had a king. Mm -hmm. And that gave an image that um, perhaps r rings a little bit off with us uh, because it's not part of our normal uh, reality. But it certainly, even, even here, um, we, of course, use as our surrogate uh, monarch the uh, Queen of England. Uh, you know, if I were to go into a room and say the queen has died, no one would wonder which of the queens in the world had died. Mm -hmm. There's one. And because of that, we do have at least some inkling of the pageantry and the majesty that belongs to, to a monarchy. And we take that and we look then at the savior and get some idea of the all we should have whenever we consider him mm -hmm. yeah that's great thank you thank you anything else anyone all right well next week is apostle and high priest of our confession and then the the following week will be our last one november 24th light of the world and so I'm already uh, looking forward to those. So, um, uh, Dad, I'll call on you if you're willing to uh, lead us in a little prayer here as we end. And uh, appreciate Denver and Lorna. Good and uh, good to have you guys here, Mom and Dad. Father in heaven, we thank you for this day. We thank you for uh, the chance we have to be uh, together and uh, and and study your. Uh, we're in all praise and, and all glory to your name, and we pray that, that your kingdom would be uh, uh, recognized more and more by all the people. And, uh, and thank you for Jesus, and in uh, his name we pray. Amen.